John said, you need another baptism from someone else. And he regularly enjoined everybody he baptized in water. They would require two baptisms. And there is a man coming after me who can give you the other baptism that you need that will keep you clean, that will clean up your future as well as your past. It is necessary for you to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Luke 3, 15 through 16. The people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John could be the Christ. John answered all of them, I baptize you with water, but one more powerful than I will come, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Dealing with your past is only half the battle. It will not keep you from sinning. Baptism in water only addresses your past. It does a good job of cleaning that up. Begin your Christian life with a thorough bath and a feeling of cleanliness. It is for this reason that Jesus instructed us to do so. He wasn't wondering, what can I do to put my discipleship to the test? Yes, I know. I'll check if they're willing to get their clothes soaked in front of everyone. That isn't what it's all about. And far too many people believe it is merely a testimony to others. It's not at all like that. It's off to a good start. That is why Ananias said to Paul, what are you waiting for? Rise and be baptized and have your sins washed away. Acts 22:16. I believe baptism works. It does clean up the inside of people. Its purpose is to provide them with a fresh start in the Christian life. However, it will not keep them clean. You'll need a new baptism for that. And John stated he wouldn't be able to do it for them. At the time he first said it, he did not know who that person was going to be. When his cousin Jesus responded, baptize me, he was taken aback because everyone already knew that Jesus was living a completely pure life, and John said that Jesus should be baptizing him. Despite the fact that he had baptized hundreds of others, he claimed that Jesus should baptize him. But Jesus refused. It is right to do what is right. Matthew 3, 13-15 Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Jesus replied, Let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. Doing what is proper is the right thing to do. And every Christian today who claims, I don't need to be baptized in water, must acknowledge that Jesus thought it vital for himself to be obedient to God, not to get clean. Doesn't that leave everyone else without a single excuse? Now let us move on. John knew first that the king was coming, and he knew that somebody else would be a baptizer, though not in water, but in Holy Spirit. Matthew 3, 16-17 As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. And he had said he had seen it happen. He not only saw the dove come down, but he heard a voice that people thought was like a thunderclap. When God speaks out loud, it is very loud and it sounds just like a thunderclap. But John could hear the words. The crowd said, What a thunder! But John heard the words, This is my beloved Son. God was so pleased that Jesus was baptized. How dare any of us displease God by not doing it? As a result, John said two things about Jesus. This is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He said, adding, And this is the one who can baptize you in the Holy Spirit. The latter appears at the start of each of the four Gospels. Furthermore, just one Gospel says, He is the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world, while the other three say, He is the one who baptizes in Holy Spirit. Furthermore, when John said he is the lamb that takes away the sin of the world, he only said it once in private. Yet when he said, this is the one who baptizes in the Spirit, he spoke it to everyone. You need two things to get to heaven, forgiveness and holiness. Hebrews 12, 14. Pursue peace with everyone, as well as holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. Because heaven is a holy place, if you aren't holy before you get there, you will quickly ruin it for yourself and everyone else. If you went to heaven as you are, if I went to heaven as I am, we would spoil it. 
You can come and worship just as you are, but you can't go to heaven just as you are. If we went just as we are now, it wouldn't be heaven for any of us. Therefore, we require forgiveness and holiness, the first of which is the work of the second person of the Trinity, Jesus, and the second of which is the work of the third person, the Holy Spirit. You require both, which simply implies that you must accept two persons, the second and third persons of the Trinity, in order to live the Christian life. You need both Jesus and the Holy Spirit, and Scripture makes it clear that you can't have one without the other. This is a crucial factor to remember. Acts 8, 15-17 When they arrived, they prayed for the new believers there that they might receive the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. There were some people who had confessed their sins, believed in Jesus, been baptized in water, and were overjoyed, but none of them had received the Holy Spirit, according to the Bible. So Peter and John came down from Jerusalem to pray for them. It was unheard of for someone to believe in Jesus but not receive the Holy Spirit. They needed to correct the situation right away. Yes, you have accepted Jesus into your life and trusted Him to forgive your sins, but you will require more. A third person exists, and his job is extremely necessary for living the Christian life. You'll need two baptisms. You'll need two people to mold you into the image of God, who made you in the first place. Now, during his lifetime, Jesus accomplished many beautiful things. He cured the sick, cast out devils, calmed the storm, and fed 5,000 people with just a few fish and loaves. He achieved incredible things, yet he never baptized anyone in the Spirit. Have you ever thought about it? John had said he would baptize you in the Holy Spirit. I won't be able to help you, but he will, and he never did while on earth. Never, ever. I'm curious if anyone noticed or inquired about it. He was continuously talking about being baptized in the Spirit according to the Bible. Did you know that? He talked about it all the time, but he never did it, until the night before he died. He added, Right now, I'm going to talk to you about another comforter, the Holy Spirit. And I will ask the Father, and He will give you another helper, comforter, advocate, intercessor, counselor, strengthener, standby, to be with you forever. Comforter in Scripture is the Greek word parakletos, or paraclete, which simply means stand beside. A lovely word. I am going to send you someone else who will stand beside you, and he then said a very interesting thing. He has been with you, but he will be in you. He has been alongside you already, but he wants to be inside you, and that is a really big step. We now have the Holy Spirit living within us. A sign and a command were given by Jesus to his disciples. He promised that on the night he died, because the twelve disciples didn't have it yet, then, when he returned to them on the first night after his resurrection, he spoke to them about the Holy Spirit and gave them a sign and a mandate. Now I'd like you to know something. Nothing happened at that time. He blew on each of them and remarked, Here is the sign. He gave them an important instruction after he had blown, Accept the Holy Spirit. And then there was nothing. There is no record of them being received, and one of the eleven apostles went missing that night. Thomas had vanished. So what did he lose out on? No, when he returned, the other ten would inform him that they had been given a sign and a directive. We must receive when Jesus blows on us. It was a rehearsal for a performance that would take place fifty days later. That was all there was to it. There is no evidence that anything happened at that time. He inhaled deeply and then said, Now receive. Had they received then, he would have told them to receive first and then would have blown on them. But he didn't. He blew, then he told them to receive, and they knew that the next time Jesus blew on them, they must surrender and receive what he was giving them. He left them six weeks later and returned to his heavenly home. He told them to wait. You will be baptized in the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And it was ten days. Ten days later, nine o'clock in the morning, they are all at the temple, not the upper room in the house of God, praying, a very public area, ten days later, at nine o'clock in the morning. There were a total of 120 of them, including Mary, Jesus' mother. 
The ten are present, and Thomas is there, and now they have elected another individual who was called Matthias. Matthias took Judas's place. They are all there, and now at last they were baptized in the Holy Spirit of Jesus in heaven. While he was on earth, he never did it. I have to go back before he can come, he explained. For this to happen down here, I need to be up there, and Jesus could only do it once he returned to heaven. John chapter 14, verse 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. He became a Baptist four years or thereabouts after his cousin John. However, Jesus was baptizing in the Holy Spirit, and now it happened. For the first time in human history, Jesus back in heaven baptized a group of people in the Holy Spirit. I am sure you know the story well enough for me not to have to go into it, but there was an outside of it and an inside. Outside, the wind was blowing and the fire was sitting on each of them. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together, and were confounded, because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed, and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? When you stop to get some petrol on the way, how do I know when the petrol tank is full? When it overflowed out of the little hole at the back of your car. However, we now have automatic pumps. How do you know when anybody is full of anything? Well, God has provided you with an overflow. So when you are filled with the Holy Spirit, something will come out of your mouth, and that is exactly what happened on the day of Pentecost. They were all filled. Jesus had spoken, you will all be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Now they were filled, same thing, filled to overflowing, and they began to praise. They erupted in worship, and praise erupted. The only thing was they were using languages they had never learned. Languages is the word that is used here. They extolled the mighty works of God in languages they had never learned. But then, God knows all languages, doesn't he? As a result, they burst forth in praise to God in unfamiliar languages. Of course, 120 individuals making that kind of noise makes a lot of noise, and everyone else in the temple can hear it. They said they were inebriated. You don't act like that in temples, just as you don't act like that in church nowadays. They said they were drunk, and Peter responded, Drunk at 9 o'clock in the morning. It's unheard of. Acts chapter 2, verses 13 through 18. But others were laughing and joking and ridiculing them, saying, They are full of sweet wine and are drunk. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea and all you who live in Jerusalem, let this be explained to you. Listen closely and pay attention to what I have to say. These people are not drunk, as you assume, since it is only the third hour of the day, 9 a.m. But this is the beginning of what was spoken of through the prophet Joel. And it shall be in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my Spirit upon all mankind, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see divinely prompted visions, and your old men shall dream divinely prompted dreams. Even on my bond servants, both men and women, I will in those days pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. This is what Joel predicted. This is the spirit of prophecy introducing the prophethood of all believers. That is what is said. That is what it was, and the spirit of prophecy was being poured out on all kinds of people, regardless of age or class, as Joel had said. The Holy Spirit is poured out on all flesh, all kinds of flesh. Every year since, churches have remembered and celebrated that event, which is fundamental to the Christian church and all Christian living. So 120 people understood what it meant to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. It was an experience, albeit a conscious one. They knew when it happened and were able to put a date on it. It happened on the Jewish Feast of Pentecost.